Let's wade into the subject of control logic for the RISC 532 iCPU. A link to the series is at the card at the upper right of the screen. What you see here is I've merged in modules from those prior videos. I want to take a few register to register instructions and I want to build a data path to show how those instructions would work. So uh, first thing is uh, we're going to call this design data path. And I want to build a data path to implement the following instructions. So I want to build an add uh, destination x2 for the sum of x3 and x4. I'm not going to do the whole thing here because I just want to give a gist of one technique that you can use to build control logic. So let's start with inputs and outputs for our for our data path. Um, obviously, we're going to start with an instruction, and let's make the instruction just a constant. And from our instruction, we're going to put it into an R splitter because we're dealing with register to register instructions, and uh, the R splitter is the record format, RISC32 record format that deals with that. And again, I covered these in prior videos. If this doesn't make sense to you, I encourage you to go watch them. Uh, so we're going to route our input instruction into the instruction input of the R splitter. Let's pull in a register file because obviously with a register to register, uh, we need to be able to get information from the registers. So we're going to use a register file module. This contains our 32 of our 32-bit registers and need to be able to perform an operation on the data contained within these registers. So let's pull in our ALU as well. And as output for this data path, um, we really want to know uh, what the result of our ALU is going to be, although that's really not the final result. The final result is whether or not we can write into the destination register. In this case, it would be register x2 for all of these instructions, and x2 would be contained in the register file, but at least we can see what's going to come out of the, the ALU by putting a pin out here of 32 bits as an output, and let's make it hexadecimal. So this will be the output from the data path. Okay, so let's just wire these together because it's fairly obvious, I guess, how these might be wired together. So from the R splitter, uh, we have a register source one and register source two already figured out. So we're just going to pipe those across to the register file because these formulate the index of the register that we're interested in, because that's what's encoded on the instruction. And that's what the register file takes, is it takes the register source index, labeled 1 and 2, uh, to determine which register source data is going to be output on the register file module. Also, the destination register destination, which is basically x2 in this case for these instructions, uh, we need to know what the index of that is. And again, uh, that is determined from this register destination index on the R splitter record. Now we need to feed some data into the ALU to be able to perform any of these given instructions. And let's, so let's just map the register source uh, data elements that are coming from the register file over to the ALU. Now, uh, the actual value that we're going to write back into the register file, which would be x2 in this case, comes from the output of the ALU. And so we can just, and I don't normally like to do this, but I'm going to be messy this time because I think it's just expedient. Uh, we're going to go ahead and map across the data output of the ALU to the uh, received data the input of the register file. 
Now, um, in order to be able to make this work, this, this, hap this has to occur on a clock tick. So we're going to need a clock in order to make that happen. Now, this is just about all wired up, but what you'll notice is we have on the register file, we need to know when to enable writing. And we also need to know which uh, function to pick in the ALU, and that's what this selector is for. So this is where the control logic comes in. We need a way to map the value of the instruction to these two different control signals. Th this select signal happens to be four bits wide. This write enable signal is one bit wide. So we got five bits of control signal that we need to come up with based upon the value of the instruction. So uh, how do we do that? And I'm going to show you one way in this video. I will say this is not optimal, and it's not optimal from the standpoint of minimizing the number of uh, logic gates that one would use to build it, but that's not really the point. That This is really more of an educational video on you know, how to just get something to work. Uh, as you get more advanced into this stuff, there are techniques that you can employ to minimize uh, control circuitry, but that's not really the point of this video. So what do I have here? Uh, I have a, a truth table that I'd like to build where I have instructions here in column A. I have the inputs that are driving those um, selection of those instructions. And then I have outputs of our control signals that we want to create. And so how do I know these are the inputs that drive the selection of these instructions? Well, from the RIS-35 uh, instruction card, I pulled the R type, which is the register type records that we're dealing with here. And what you can see is uh, I have an opcode, and the bits of the opcode that we care about in this case are bits uh, six, bits six through two, which if we look down here, these are the instructions that we care about. The opcode bits, so this is bit, this column right here is bit six, so six, five, four, three, two. This is the section of the opcode that we that we care about. We're gonna ignore these these two bits, they're all the same across all the instructions for a RISC-532i CPU. Um, then we need the, the FUNCT3, and FUNCT3 is located from bits uh, 14 through bits 12 of the instruction on the R type. So you'll see that I have bit 14, 13, and 12 listed here as the input of the, uh, of the truth table. And then finally, um, one additional bit that makes a determination as to which of these instructions you're dealing with is um, actual, actually bit 30 from the instruction, which is part of Funct 7. And that's what this is meant to represent here. When this value here has a 2 in it, uh, this is actually 32 decimal, which represents the sixth bit of this Funct 7 field, which is um, bit 30, which is why I have um, bit 30 represented in this column. So this is the truth table that we want to build for these four instructions because this is the truth table that we need in order to implement our control logic for the data path. So uh, let's start filling in the truth table. For the add instruction, bit 30 is being zero, so let's just go ahead and start there. And it also has Funct3 as being zero. So the three bits in Funct3, uh, 14, 13, and 12, these will all be zeros as well. Then our opcode starting at bit six is a zero, followed by a one, one, and then uh, two zeros right here. So zero and zero. For a subtract instruction, um, bit 30, which again comes from Funct7, is high. That's what the um, two hex representing 32 and the six bit is 32. So this needs to be high. And our funct three for the subtract is all zeros. So that'll be zero, zero, zero. And then again, it's the same instruction or, or the same opcode, um, zero, one, one, zero, zero. So let's do the or. So for the OR instruction, uh, our Funct 7 uh, bit 30 is 0. And our Funct 3 now, in this case, is uh, 6 hex. 
So to get six out of these three bits, we need this bit, which represents four, and this bit, which represents two, so two plus four is six, to be high. And our ones place for these, for these three bits here would be zero. So that, so this funct three, which is I14, 13, and 12, being one, one, zero, will yield six hex. Finally, again, it's the same opcode, zero, one, one, zero, zero, and zero. So let's do the AND. So bit 30 of the AND is in funct seven, and that's a zero again. So here's a zero. And then bits 14, 13, and 12 for the AND is seven hex. So to get seven out of three bits, that would be one, one, and one. And then we have the same opcode again, zero, one, one, zero, and zero. So let's do the outputs. We need to know what the selector is for the add instruction um, that we need to send to the ALU to result in the ALU performing an add operation. So let's go look in the ALU. And right here, you will notice that the multiplexer uh, contains the selector which will map the add instruction to zero. So what we need then for these selector bits, AS3, uh, three, 2, and three, two, one, and zero is all zeros in order to get the correct selector selected on the ALU. Now, as for this final bit, this is the register write enable bit and as it turns out, for register to register instructions, uh, we, we want to write the result from the ALU back to the register file in all of these cases. So this bit actually needs to be a one for all of these instructions, which sort of makes figuring out that bit pretty simple. So now let's go back and look at the subtract instruction. What does the ALU selector need to be in order to be able to select a subtract instruction. Well, again, if we go over here, it needs to be an eight. So to get an eight out of a four bit word, so that's one, two, four, eight. So that needs to be high and all of these need to be low. So let's do the or. The OR is six. So to get a six, that needs to be a zero, a one, a one, and a zero. And to get the AND, the AND is seven, I believe. Yes, it's seven. So to get a seven, we need zero, one, one, and one. Here formulates the truth table that we'll use to implement our control logic. Let's build a new circuit. So let's talk about inputs and outputs. Uh, control logic is gonna take an instruction and out of the control logic, we need two things, right? We're trying to get the selector for the ALU and we're trying to get the register write enable signal. So let's put those out there. Now, since we're dealing with individual bits, um, let's go ahead and put splitters on these pins. Now, what I want to do is I want to create tunnels on all the pins uh, for these splitters that, that we care about. And now on our ALU selector, let's put some tunnels over here. So now the first thing that we need to do when building this control logic is we need to know which instruction it is that we're dealing with. So if we want to know whether or not we have an add instruction, we can do that with an AND gate. And we need this AND gate to have the same number of inputs as we have input bits. And remember, we derive these from our truth table. 
So let's give this nine bits. And let's go ahead and position our tunnels. for input into our gate. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to negate all of these and I'll, I'll show you why I'm going to do that in a second. And now I'm going to connect up all of our inputs to this AND gate. Now this AND gate is going to tell us whether or not we have an add instruction. So let's put a tunnel out here to indicate that. Now to configure this AND gate correctly, we need to go back to our truth table. And if we look at our truth table, bits five, 5 and 4 need to be a 1. So in order to make this AND gate tell us whether this is an add instruction, bit 5 and 4 should not be negated. So this happens to be bit uh, 1, 2. So this needs to be bit 3 and 4 on the AND gate. We need to turn negation off. Now you'll see the reason why I negated all these in the first place is because when you do that in Logisim, it, it disconnects the connection, which is easy for you to reconnect. If you actually did it the other way around, it would create additional wires that you have to go back in and delete, which I find really annoying. So I can just go back now and reconnect these. And so this now formulates a, a logic, a set of logic that tells us whether or not our instruction is calling for an add operation. Let's do the subtract. I'm going to cheat now and I'm going to copy this and stick it down here. So when we're dealing with a subtract, again, what does our truth table look like? Our truth table says that Bit 30 now must be high along with bits 4 and 5. So what this means then is bit 30, which is the end bit on our AND gate, which is number 9, needs to be a no. Okay, let's do the OR. What does the truth table say about our OR? Uh, so that means that bits 14, 13, 5, and 4 need to be high. So let's fit, fix bit 30. But 14 and 13, which would be these two here, Right, so 14 and 13 need to be high. And along with 4 and 5, which we already had, the rest of them need to be low. So that looks good for the OR. Let's do the AND. All right, what does the truth table say for our AND? So the AND... Bits 14, 13, and 12 need to be high, and then, of course, 4 and 5. So 14, 13, and 12, which would mean that this one needs to be high and not negated. So 14, 13, and 12 must be high, not negated. Bits 4 and 5 must be high, not negated, and the rest negated. And that gives you an indicator of whether you've got an AND instruction or not. Okay, so now that we have all of those figured out, how is it that we get these mapped over to these? Well, if we go back to our truth table, if we look down these columns, we could make a determination as to whether or not this bit sh these bits should be high by simply ORing together all of the values that are in any given one of these columns. Let's do let's do this column. So let's let's formulate the ALU selector bit number three. Now in this particular case, the only time that this 
bit can be a one is, is when we have a subtract instruction. In this case, you don't need to or them together because there's one and only one, one in this column. Let's do the AS2 bit. So the, so the AS2 bit says we need, when, whenever we have an, an, or, an or or an and, these need to be a one. So let's or together the or and the and for AS2. Okay, let's, let's have a look at AS1. Well, you'll notice that AS1 and AS2, they have the same values. So we could just hook AS1 up to AS2 and get the same effect. So finally, we have uh, AS0. And like AS3, AS0 has only got one row with a one. So we can just map the AND instruction to AS0 directly. OK, and finally, the final signal, we need the register write enable signal. Back to our truth table. So register write enable needs to be high when this is a one, this is a one, this is a one, or this is a one, right? So all of these, all of these instructions, if we or them together, we should get that result, right? So we need a four input or gate. And I'm just gonna wire the result of this directly to the write enable. So let's hook this control logic up back into our data path. So let's just wire this stuff up directly without tunnels. It'll be a little spaghetti, but I think it'll be good enough to visualize here. All right, can we test this? Let's do. In order to test it, we need to know what the machine language is for each one of these instructions. And so I happen to go to the online assembler, uh, which I have linked in the description to the video, and I obtained for each of these instructions what the machine language translation is. And I'll just write that out here because you can go and do that yourself if you'd like. Okay, let's try the add instruction first. So we need in our instruction the value of the machine language for the add instruction, which would be 00418133. Now, we need some data to add together, and in this case, the data that we're adding together should be in registers 3 and register 4. So let's go into the register file. So let's put, let's say, the number 5 into register 3, and uh, let's say the number 1 in register 4. Now, we can already see that some of our control logic is working because we have on the output, we have an output of 6, which 5 plus 1 is 6, so that actually that makes sense. But what we ultimately want to see is this, this instruction is not complete until this value of 6 is placed into register 2, which if we go look uh, at the register file, Register 2 doesn't have 6 in it yet. Well, the reason it doesn't is because we have not ticked the clock. So we have to go back here, and we need to tick the clock once. 
All right, I ticked the clock. Now let's go back into the register file. And indeed now, register two has the value six in it. So our data path, at least for the add instruction, seems to be working. Let's put in the subtract. Okay, and already our output of four makes sense because it's five minus one. Um, let's see if the four, well, let's look at the register file right now. So register two has, still has a six in it. That's from our prior instruction. When we tick the clock, we should see this go to four. So let's tick the clock. And now we have a four here. So our subtract instruction data path looks correct. Let's do the OR. So that's 0041E133. Zero, zero, e, three, three. Okay, so if you OR a number 1 and a number 5, the first bit, so, so if you have a decimal 5, the first bit should be a 1, and the third bit should be a 1, and for decimal one, the first bit should be a one. So if you OR those two together, you should get five. And indeed, on the output here, we, we get five. So can we get this transferred into register two? Let's look at the register file. So that has a four in it from the prior instruction. So let's tick the clock. Now we look at the register file and we have a five. So it looks like the OR is working. Final one, let's do the AND. Now if we think about AND before I type the number in here, a one and a five, if you AND those two together, the only common bits is the ones bit. So I would expect it to see this to be a one when we AND one and five together. So let's put our machine language in here. And indeed, we have a one. Will this register transfer? Let's just tick the clock uh, here. Go into the register file. And indeed, we have a one. So that is how you would use a truth table and use uh, basic logic gates to put together a control logic for really any CPU. But there is another way to go about doing this. Um, I think it's a, uh, it's a way that is more convenient. Maybe it's not optimal, but I find it much easier. And so in the next video, we'll talk about this second technique. Thanks for watching.